today we're going to talk about light field cameras, okay, which are a bit of a physics nightmare, but make for some really cool images. I was a bit bemused online because I looked at dozens of articles on how it works and none of them told me. The summary is it's a magic box and then you can refocus the image, okay? In actual fact, it's fairly intuitive once you understand it, but it's mathematically fairly complicated. We're going to skip past most of the maths because you'd only need to know that if you're implementing it. Um, and we're going to talk about basically optically, how does it work? This camera is developed by a company called Lytro. Let me just try and focus on that. Go oh, on. Yeah. I am focused now on it. Okay. Yeah, you're focused on it. Okay, but if I move it, you're not. It's a problem, okay? So what a light field camera does is let you focus kind of magically after you've taken a picture. So when you take a picture, you don't really care about focusing. This doesn't have a focus knob on it or any kind of autofocus. It does this by essentially capturing much more information on the light entering the scene than a normal camera, okay? Now this is a Lytro, which is a brand name, okay, for a consumer um, planoptic or light field camera, okay? There are other companies around, Ratrix is one that do more industrial level uh, light field cameras, which we'll talk about a little bit, okay? Um, I'm holding up a Lytro mainly because I own a Lytro and, um, or I should say the school owns a Lytro, uh, and uh, we can perhaps take a test image and I can show you the kind of sort of things you can do with a Lytro image that you perhaps can't do with a normal image. So before we get into that, just talk me through this because it doesn't look quite like any normal camera. No, all you do with this is you point it at something, so I'll take this, there's the lens, right? You point it at something and you press go and it takes a picture. Okay, there we go. I mean, yes, to an extent you have to worry about what you're taking a picture of because it's still photography, right? But later on I'll worry about what do I want in the foreground, what do I want in the background, or do I actually want to change them and have it interactive, or maybe I want to sort of move the angle slightly of the image. You point it at something, you take a picture, and then you're done, okay? And any kind of other effects like um, depth of field and things you worry about later on the computer. Okay, so perhaps we should take a test image and we'll see what it looks like. Go on, okay, so I'll, I'm gonna move over here for a minute, okay and then we'll see what that looks like on the laptop. Okay, so we plug this in, very straightforward, we run the software. This isn't a normal image, right? There's a lot more information that we'll talk about in a minute, but it means that you have to process them before you can look at them properly, okay? And what that does is essentially reconstruct a proper image based on all the information that it's got. So if we click on an image, now we can see we've got a picture of you, and I can click on different parts of this image and focus on them. Now I've clicked on your head and you're in focus, and I click on the camera and that's in focus, or on the back, back wall and that's sort of more in focus. And essentially, what we're doing here is refocusing after the image has been taken, which is good because I'm not very good at focusing images, and so I can just click and point and click. Now, there are obviously stipulations. The image isn't hugely high resolution, um, and if you take an image that's just bad, it's not going to be saved by the fact that I can tweak it post-processing. Okay? Um, but it's quite a cool feature. Another nice feature is that we can do a kind of perspective shift. An image that shows us really well is this picture of a keyboard that we took. So in this keyboard, we can still focus on the background or the foreground, just like we could before. But we can also click and move the image around. And you can see that there's a sort of parallax thing going on. The background is moving more than the foreground. So we're actually changing the viewpoint the camera, the photograph has been taken from, which is kind of unintuitive because there's only one lens. How is that done? So the first thing to do is to talk about how a regular camera works with a lens. And that will give you some idea of what the difference is between this and, and, and this Lytro. So we're talking about a scene on the left and my camera on the right hand side and a really simple model for my camera. Now, we won't dwell on the fact that lenses usually have more optical uh, elements in them than that. And we'll pretend this is my nice, perfect lens that bends light just how I want. Okay? And this is my CCD. So that's the sensor or the chip in the camera. And if anyone wants to see more about those, we can go and look you at You can look at that in the video on the biofilter. Light enters the scene from this direction, through the lens, and then hits the back of a sensor. We won't worry about which orientation the image is on. Obviously it's upside down, but that's obviously changed in post-processing. So if we use our nice red pen for our light, a light ray comes in here from this object here. It hits the lens, and then it's bent a certain amount based on the shape of the lens, and then comes and hits another point on the sensor. Now, what's really interesting is that there isn't just a single ray of light coming from, say, your face when I take a picture of you straight into the camera. There are millions, millions of photons, right, all in all different directions. So what in fact happens is if this is a part of some feature that I'm looking at, light comes in all different directions, this direction, this direction, this direction, and all gets bent around and hits the CCD at the exact right point. And then we have a lovely image that's in focus. Fortunately, it's never quite that simple, is it? Especially with my photography. So. Imagine that instead we've either moved our lens or our object's moved. Okay, so now our object is here, okay, slightly in front of where it was before. The lens bends the light the same amount as it did before. Okay, it's not got better suddenly. So our light comes out like this, 
and it comes together behind the CCD. So that's what happens when you've got out of focus shots. So that, that effectively, the fact that it's not converged on a point is a blur. Yeah, um, and a very distinctive lens blur. So the light from this object has basically been split over all this part of the sensor. Ideal in some kind of nice photography, not ideal if that's what you're taking a picture of. And the same is true of an object that's too far away. The focal point will come in here and be in front of the CCD and then will spread back out again. And just the same as this will be spread over some area of the sensor. So that's what this Lytro camera tries to do away with. Another interesting feature, if we just draw another one, this CCD element just adds up all the light rays that hit it over a certain period of time. And that's what color it becomes. So this area of the rays could be blue and this area could be red. And then when you get to here, it's a mixture of blue and red. Now that might not be useful, but that's the whole point of how a camera works, okay? It, it, it essentially sums up a lot of light rays on a certain area. Why is that important? Well, imagine if we knew the differences between these light rays and these light rays, we could start to perhaps get a feel about what's going on in the scene in a little bit more detail, okay? So we've lost this orientation information. We don't know that this particular ray came from this angle and this particular ray came from this angle. All we know is they both hit here at the end, okay? That's gone, we're never getting that back. What a light field camera does is capture the orientation as well as the color of the rays. So a light field camera is really sort of an extension of a normal camera, okay? So we have our main lens, just like before, and we have our sensor, just like before. But what we also have is a micro lens array, an array of tiny lenses in a grid formation that sit just in front of our CCD, okay? So I'll draw them in. Now these are much bigger than they would be in real life. There's thousands of these. It's best to think of it perhaps, the pixel resolution of image is now these micro lenses. Light comes in from an object and it converges on one of these micro lenses, just like it would converge on a pixel. We're assuming it's in focus. So let's say this one. But now this one is not actually capturing the picture. So these light rays travel through the lens and spread back out again underneath onto the CCD, okay? So each section of CCD is responsible for capturing all the different light rays coming in for that micro lens. And you can see that the ones over this side of each lens are coming from this direction, and the ones over this side are coming from this direction. So we've preserved our orientation information. Why we do that will make some sense hopefully in a minute. Focus-wise, it's all calibrated so that the main lens and these micro lenses match up, so that essentially this is what happens. The points in the world, for the most part, come to be in focus on these micro lenses. Now that we've got all of these rays, what do we do? We've just talked about that being a blur, but presumably that's, it's not a blur, is it? No, if, if you had just an image that's out of focus, right, then what you're getting is you're getting these rays spread over bits of the CCD, okay? But you're also getting the rays of every other object spread over the CCD, and they all add up and become a really blurry image, okay? In this, it's much more controlled because only the rays from a certain point are projecting into certain areas under our micro lenses. So one of the nice things optically about how this works and might help you understand it, is that if we pick an individual pixel under a micro lens, all the light going through that pixel comes from the same place on the main lens. Okay, so we, it comes down here and it bends and it comes from this point here. Okay, this is called the sub aperture. So this pixel only ever sees light entering at that point. Okay, and this pixel over the other side only sees light entering from this point. So they essentially get different views of the scene. One from the left of the camera, one from the right of the camera. So you can start to think, okay, so we've got two views, maybe we can start to do some kind of depth reasoning about this, just like we do with our binocular stereo. Another interesting feature is every ray that passes through this sub aperture hits all the different micro lenses and always ends up on the same corresponding pixel underneath each micro lens. So if we pick pixel five underneath every micro lens, it's gonna reconstruct the entire image as seen from this point on the camera or in a different pixel this point on the camera. What we've essentially done is not just obtained orientation, but we've also obtained loads of tiny little images that view the scene from all over the main lens. Another way to look at it is that these micro lenses are just tiny cameras taking a picture of the back of a main lens, okay? And of course they're gonna have a different view because some are over on the left and some are over on the right, okay? So that might be another way of looking at it. So what do we do with this? Well, it's mathematically fairly complicated, but hopefully intuitively not too bad. Um, let's imagine that we want to um, do our parallax shift, okay, because that's a nice easy one, okay. We want to view um, the image from the left and then we want to pan over and view it slightly from the right. And of course, you saw from the, from the software that the parallax isn't huge, we're talking a small amount, and that's because the width of the main lens is not huge. If we look at these, this CCD from the back, okay, and we look at two neighbouring micro lens arrays, if we're both going to get pictures that look a bit like this, so essentially pictures of this lens from slightly different positions. And some stuff in the scene will be happening in these pixels. Now, just like I said that all the rays going through a certain pixel 
go through a certain sub-aperture, and crucially, all the rays through this sub-aperture hit the equivalent pixels, that's true. If we take this pixel from this micro lens, and the same pixel in this micro lens, and the same pixel in the next micro lens, for every micro lens, we get a tiny image from the left-hand side of the lens. And if we do the same thing, but with these pixels, on the right, we get the same for the right-hand side of the lens. Or it might be left and right, you know, optics. Okay, so we can get a parallax shift by basically reconstructing our image by taking one pixel from each of the micro lenses. Perhaps the most obvious and perhaps most sort of magical feature of the Ploptic camera is refocusing. So refocusing is essentially moving the CCD relative to the main lens. I mean, actually you move the main lens optics in a normal camera, but we're not gonna do that. So if we fix our main lens here, and we pretend that there's a, a nice new sensor in here, okay? This object is now gonna be out of focus, this red object, but other objects might become in focus. Normally, how a regular camera works, if we were taking this image at this level of focus, we, would, we wouldn't be able to reconstruct these rays because we don't have them. But we have these rays because we've got a plenoptic camera. So we can work out which of these rays we need to sample from to reconstruct what this image would look like if the CCD had been here instead of here. So it's essentially a mathematical summation of lots of different pixels in these micro lenses. So that's basically how a Lytro camera works. The micro lenses are obviously fixed in front of a CCD, so this camera will always operate in this fashion. The Lytro itself is, is proprietary software in a proprietary format, so you plug your camera in, you use Lytro software to extract it. Okay, but what you're gonna get out is essentially a kind of animatable, image that you can move about and change the focus and twiddle with in really cool ways. And then if you publish them online, they call them living pictures, they can move about and you can sort of draw focus of the viewer to interesting parts of the image by kind of zooming in or by bringing them into focus suddenly. So it's quite nifty. It's like a pair of those 3D glasses that you use where one side's red and one side's blue, but you've also got green ones and you've got them in a grid arrangement in front of your, your camera's eye. 